Larry Hancock. Hello, Larry. It's Stuart. Hello, Stuart and everyone. Hey! hey. <laughs> Great to talk to you. It sounds like everyone is still awake after lunch. They are. Yeah. <laughs> sure. I'm, I'm I'm We've had a few beers, but we're still all up for it, I'm telling you. <laughs> oh, good. Maybe it's a good thing I'm doing this remotely then. <laughs> Just in case anybody brought fruit back with them or anything from lunch. <laughs> Did you have any uh, tidbits yesterday after your um, hunt? Or? Oh, uh, yes, we we did. I, I I let's just say that I probably overindulged on the calf rice. Uh, you all wouldn't know, but Stuart and I were discussing the relative merits of haggis and calf rice, and it's probably not something anyone wants to go into right after lunch. <laughs> Any time, any time, Larry. <laughs> anyway, we're uh, ready and uh, looking forward to your uh, presentation as, as ever, Larry. Well, great. I guess we've got the PowerPoint up then. We have, yep. Well, by way of introduction, just, just to set the stage a little bit, uh, for those who may not know me, uh, I have been researching this subject for just short of 30 years. It, it seems amazing when I see it, say it, and I really try not to count the number of years, but um, for, the, for the first seven or eight years, I focused on the thought that if one really did a clinical and thorough job and looking at Dealey Plaza and the crime scene evidence and the autopsy, that one could obviously reach a conclusion. Uh, after seven or eight years, I decided, quite frankly, that all of that information had been sufficiently obstructed, obfuscated, muddied, and I turned in another direction and for the remainder of my time I've been investigating and researching basically names. Uh, people uh, going into this whole thing through the back door rather than the front door, the evidentiary door. Um, so I've been looking at names of people that might really have had some inside knowledge of the attack in Dallas. And uh, that's, that surfaced several names, some of which will come up during this presentation. But uh, that's kind of the background to what I've been doing for a number of years. In this instance, we're going to be talking about Gene Wheaton. And Gene Wheaton was brought to my attention, as have so many things, by Malcolm Blunt. Uh, I don't know if Malcolm is in the audience or not. He is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that means that Malcolm probably already knows more about this than I do, but I'm just going to try to head anyway. Um, and maybe you'll be able to offer him something new. The, the, the point of this presentation and this research and, and of Gene Wheaton, and Gene Wheaton leads us into an area basically, not that Gene Wheaton himself was personally involved, but Gene Wheaton comes forth as an individual who may have heard discussions, names, and conversations uh, with people that he was associated with that truly would give us an inside view into a bit of the motive and a, a bit of the context of the attack on JFK in Dallas, as well as, as, as names, names for further research, and that's one of the the things that's most important. And as I said, Wheaton himself and the first couple of documents down this trail came to me from Malcolm, who had found them in his research, and Stu Wexler and I immediately jumped into it. And in that regard, since we're talking about names, then let's go to the second slide. The reason we know about Gene Wheaton at all is because Gene Wheaton himself approached the ARRB. Now there have been other people, credible people, that did uh, quietly approach different investigative bodies, uh, whether it be the HSCA, in this case the ARRB, because I think like many people during the era of the ARRB, Wheaton really had the impression that this was a new investigation. Now, of course, the ARB's view of matters was simply that they were collecting documents that had not been collected before that were germane to the subject. Uh, but Wheaton 
and, and others, I must say, I've run across others, thought that they were actually doing something of an investigation, and he had something that he wanted to bring to their attention from an investigative standpoint. And to the ARB, in materials that he supplied to them, and in, in documents, uh, Wheaton identified two individuals, not second parties, known to himself, who he felt had information about the assassination. I, more than felt, he, he was convinced that they had information about the assassination. As a matter of fact, by this point in time, he had already, early on, told those two individuals that they should be obligated to bring what they knew into official investigation. He had tried to arrange uh, a meeting between them and a senator that he knew quite well to to basically set up a, an agreement where they could provide their information without fear of being prosecuted. That had not worked for a variety of reasons, and this was almost like an, a last-ditch effort for him to approach the ARB with the thought that perhaps the ARB would turn around and pursue it from their end. Um, Wheaton obtained this information and heard conversations by these individuals in the 1980s while he was engaged in trying to sell air transport services for the uh, Contra military effort that was going on under the Reagan administration, uh, basically orchestrated by Oliver North after the CIA had been more or less taken off the case by Congress. And at that point in time, because the CIA had been taken off the case and really forbidden to do military support for this effort, it was being privatized by North and by Secord, who was working for them. And they were contracting services, including air transport, because they had to get these military supplies and weapons down into the Contras, who were staging raids into Nicaragua. Um, so the information that he provides comes from that period in the 1980s. It's nothing contemporary from the 60s. This is something he heard during the 1980s. And he heard it in what I would call war story, story conversations. It's not like the people that he was talking to just jumped to the fore and said, oh, by the way, you know, I know guys who killed JFK. Uh, this was a basically a sales effort that went on for a number of months while he was uh, trying to attain contacts. And the sales agent that he had employed in this effort was a fellow named Carl Jenkins. And Jenkins was serving as his chief sales effort and, and contacting the people under Oliver North who were really doing the logistics of the air transport into uh, for the project. Um, the other person that was involved was Raphael Quintaro. Uh, he was actually working for North Sea Court, and uh, he was doing field work in setting up agreements, shipping agreements, transportation agreements, doing legal paperwork in certain countries for transshipment. And so, right off the bat, we know from the information that Jenkins supplied the ARB that names come up in the story are Carl Jenkins and Raphael Quintero, who actually also happen to be a personal friend of Wheaton. So that's where this whole whole investigation started was with these names. And the first thing, of course, out of the bat, uh, when Malcolm provided the information, was for us to do some document research and to see if Jenkins and Quintero, you know, they, they were not names. Jenkins had never been mentioned in regard to JFK. Uh, at the time we did this, over a decade ago, got into this, uh, these were pretty much new names to us. Fortunately, with the documents that were already available on the Mary Farrell site, we were able to pretty quickly move forward and determine that these were indeed very real people and names that actually should have been familiar to us. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. Okay. <coughs> so the information that Wheaton was offering to the ARB was the fact that it, this is his view that he got from these conversations he heard. And when I'm talking about war stories, okay, these, 
These fellows are associating with each other over a period of probably half a year, perhaps more. Uh, Quintero uh, actually was a close enough friend so that Jenkins was staying at his house much of the time. They would get together at hotels, motels, um, and the typical kind of, of sales pitch. They'd get drinks and they'd sit down and talk and uh, basically <coughs> Jenkins and, and Wheaton were trying to convince them of their own credentials and how, you know, how they would be trusted because this was going to be a very secret arrangement under North and supply effort. And so this is, this is what he heard during these conversations. And, and I, I think you have to point out, again, this would have been just some exchanges, some words, maybe half hours talk during much broader conversations and war stories. And, and he, he was just a participant. He wasn't really even a participant. These guys were talking among each other, talking about their backgrounds, uh, their military experiences. And so this is what he was overhearing just as someone who was privileged to be in the same room while they were talking to each other. And the gist of the, gist of the information that he offered was that Jenkins and Quintero had either trained, and that would probably, training would probably relate to Jenkins, whose role with the CIA was a trainer. It either trained with or worked with some of the individuals who had attacked JFK in Dallas. Uh, in fact, the names of those people, when they get into the war stories, were quite well known to Jenkins and Quintero. They had worked with them, had been friends with them, had been operationally involved with them over some years in the anti-Castro effort. And as part of the dialogue, he, he made it quite clear that these, these fellows primarily said that the people that went to Dallas and the people who carried out the attack were doing so because JFK had betrayed them on Cuba. He betrayed them, he continued to betray them, he had betrayed them at the Bay of Pigs, which they'd all been involved with, he had betrayed them in the missile crisis. Uh, they just, he was, he was a constant threat because you never knew what he, when he would turn. Um, Wheaton also said that it was pretty obvious that there was a higher level motive at work in those people who were inciting and directing uh, these individuals in the attack. He really didn't hear much on that other than the fact that there were motives in play other than just revenge with other individuals. Um, as far as the ARB was concerned, Wheaton did offer them documents on himself, documents on Jenkins, documents on the country, Contra sales effort, all in an effort to establish that, yes, he was connected with these people, he was in a position to have heard their conversations, and he did a very thorough job of it. He also provided fairly intimate personal details on his relationship with Quintero, um, uh, Quintero and his wife and his family, things he had done to help the daughter. Um, and all of that, uh, that was quite interesting because it really did establish his bona fides. Now, the interesting thing about this is this was all offered to the ARB, and basically their first response to him was to send him a form letter saying, thanks, we appreciate your interest, uh, basically go take a hike. Uh, you know, this is... We're not doing an investigation. We're glad you're interested. Just go away. Well, they approached them again. He was pretty, pretty stubborn about it. Sent them more documents. Got in touch by telephone. And there were several telephone calls and exchanges of correspondence between Wheaton and the ARB staff member. And we actually have samples of those. Uh, so we know that this all did happen. There's just no doubt that the outreach happened. There's no doubt that Jenkins was, I mean, Wheaton was involved with the people he was naming. Uh, what the interesting thing is, is that there really was no follow-up. They, they just really ended up, even though he had met in person with them, offered to meet in person with them in D.C., uh, there was no follow-up on their part. And my friend Stu Wexler, who does a lot of research with me, managed to actually track down and interview the staff member who Wheaton had been 
communicating with years later, and we were fascinated by the fact that she, she claimed that she did not even remember him, that she didn't remember any of their exchanges, even when they were quoted to her, and basically it was just not something that had even stuck with her. Um, that's a bit hard to for me to accept because I'm not sure how many AARB staff members actually came in contact with anyone who offered this level of the documentation about the actual attackers on JFK. I just kind of surprising, but she claimed that she remembered none of it, even though we had the paperwork. Perhaps the more interesting thing was another friend of mine, William Law. We we actually managed to track down Wheaton in California. I get the materials to William, and William did an interview with Wheaton, who was quite shocked and surprised, I would say, that um, his information was now public, because it had been his understanding that everything he had provided the ARB would be held in confidence. It was a confidential agreement. Um, so when William showed up and started showing him the documents, it was a bit of a revelation to him. Uh, the good thing about this is that that was taped, and you can actually look at that interview with the link there I have on the page. Yeah. Uh, and that's really the only interview that we have with Wheaton. We did contact Wheaton, who, who at that time, I'll frankly say, was more concerned about his family and his grandchildren than anything else. And we contacted him over the years, including his not long before his death, and he made it clear that he knew where we were, who we were and what we were interested in talking about, but uh, he, he just had said all he was going to say. So we never got any more detail from Wheaton than what he had offered the ARB and what you, and what you see in this interview. And I guess I'll take a brief. I always like to take questions during the presentations. Does anybody have questions at this point? Any questions, folks? Uh, was that the uh, interview that we would have seen back in 2005, I think, at uh, Lance uh, Lowy? It, it is. Yeah, that is the same interview. This has been going on for a long time, as you can see. Um, the thing is, at that point in time, it, it wasn't really made publicly available. We showed it at, at uh, Lancer. Yeah. I had only had one copy of it. And we did not get permission to actually make it available until about three years ago, as I recall. Wow. So it was kind of an oddity. It was, if you had seen it, you were lucky to have seen it in person, and there were, you know, a decade passed before anybody else saw it. Wow. All right. Well, let's yes, go to the I next. One more question oh. at the moment. Sure. Right. Yeah. Um, on Jean Wheaton. Um, well, on. Uh, Quintero, uh, he stated that uh, Wheaton was telling the truth as he knew it, unquote. What does Larry think of that? Uh, I, think, I think that is true. Um, he stated the truth, that, and, and so I think what Quintero, Quintero is interesting. Uh, Jenkins has absolutely denied all, I mean, all of this. And we have, we have tried to contact Jenkins. We've, uh, people actually have made like three minute contacts with him and he doesn't want to talk about any of this. And he calls Wheaton a liar. Um, Quintero absolutely never said that. Quintero always said that Wheaton was telling the truth from what he understood of the conversation. And actually there's a quote that attributed to Wheaton in his, or sorry, attributed to Quintero in his obituary, uh, which I have been trying to source for some time now. It's in his obit, but we can't really find out where it came from. But in, in that quote that's cited in his obituary, he literally states that what Wheaton is saying is true, that there was a conspiracy, that he knew about it, it would have been, that he, he was aware of one of the most damning things in the history of the United States and had not, had decided not to talk about it. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think, I think Quintero 
went along with Jenkins in the beginning. I mean, basically, when Wheaton asked them to get together with this this senator and work on some kind of an agreement to provide their information, apparently they thought about it for some time, days, whatever. And then I'm guessing that Jenkins convinced Wintero that they weren't going to do that, and basically they came back to Wheaton and said, look, no, we're not going to do this, we're going to deny it, and if you try to do anything with this story, we'll do everything in our power to kill your reputation, undermine it, etc., etc. So, Wheaton did, on a couple of occasions over time, make remarks to people that he did interviews with, and just mentioned this in passing, but he never offered any, it was only something in passing. Uh, he was, he would talk about other things, but not this. But yeah, long-winded answer to your question, yeah, I believe Quintero knew that Wheaton was telling the truth and, and was convinced by Jenkins not to do anything with it publicly until the very end. Okay, all right, thanks. All right, information offered. Um, Okay, let's go on to the next slide. <laughs> now, I just, I throw this in because I, I consider a matter of rigor. And so the question at this point in time, after we had gotten Malcolm's information on Wheaton and the, the Quintero name, the Jenkins name, we had done quite a bit of research. Basically, Sue and I sat down and, and asked ourselves these questions. I offer this up to any researcher that is in this gray area of working with second party sources because you know it, it is a gray area it's second hand information in some cases third information third hand information and i just offer the criteria that we use when we determine that the source is good enough to go forward with it and that that's listed out on this page first of all you've got you've got to be able to document the individual's backgrounds and enough of their activities to put them in the place where they could have heard this. If you can't absolutely put them in the place at the right time for them to have heard what they're relating, then you're, you're off base to begin with. Um, so they've got to have been in the right place at the right time. You must be able to prove that they actually knew those individuals at that time. In other words, if they're representing that they had information from them, they must have known them contemporaneously. Uh, and for all three of those, we can bet Wheaton in regard to Jenkins and Quintero. Then as far as access, um, this gets moves it up to another level because you have to be able to confirm that the secondary and primary sources are associated to the extent that what they're being told or what they've overheard is credible. In other words, are they close enough to have been trusted with the information they heard? And that's a real big factor because um, we can prove that for we in many, many of the people I've looked at over the years, there's just no way that they would have been trusted yeah, basically, what you've got to do is establish almost what I would call an operational level of trust. In other words, these people are working together, have been working together in some operation, some environment where they would they would have a commitment and a trust in each other beyond just knowing each other. And I think that's what we see here. Uh, that certainly was true for Wheaton and Quintero. And when we get a little bit further, as far as naming some of the people in these war stories, we could demonstrate absolutely that these guys had been operational with each other to the point of missions, to the point of being under fire, to being under... This is, this is kind of a band of brothers thing. Uh, so that level of trust, so they would have felt free to talk about that. So I just, I just offer that out as the kind of criteria we use at that point in time to even go on with the wheat story, or we would have probably tossed it, like I have to say, I've tossed dozens and dozens 
dozens of sources over the year. So why did we think that? Let's go to the next page and we'll show you some background that we collected on Carl Jenkins. Yeah. Carl Jenkins is quite a unique individual. In fact, uh, over the last year or so, I've learned that he was much more unique than I had even believed before. Um, he was a World War II vet. He was a long time paramilitary instructor with, with the uh, CIA. By the time we turn him up with the Cuba project in 1960, you know, he had been working doing paramilitary training with the CIA for almost a decade. A guy with a long record all, all throughout Asia primarily. In 1960, he was assigned to the Cuba project, and not just as a trainer, he actually headed the first paramilitary training base for the first Cuban exile volunteers, and this was at a camp, J.M. Trav, in Panama. I'm sorry, that was different. That was camp in Panama. Then he went on to Guatemala to actually run the camp where they did the larger infantry training. To put that in perspective, what really happened with the Cuba project in the beginning, it was supposed to consist of maybe 30, maybe 100, probably no more ever than 100 very highly trained Cuban volunteers who were be, to be given extensive training and sent into Cuba to essentially contact resistance movements and lead the resistance and start a revolution against Castro. Uh, Jenkins was the guy that trained those people. Uh, after he trained those people, most of them went to Bell Chase in Louisiana for advanced training. Some of them went on to Florida, well, almost all of them went on to Florida eventually to be operated out of bases in the Keys uh, during the fall of 1960 right up to the, the landing to do infiltration, to collect intelligence, etc. Uh, so Jenkins, Jenkins had a long time contact with these people. And as a matter of fact, he was pulled off of the training for the infantry brigade in Guatemala to move him up to Florida to run these very special missions into Cuba in the three or four months before the actual landing. So. He's not just your average military detailee to the CIA. He's something special. Uh, and again, based on information that we got from Malcolm, his name is also associated <coughs> with actual sniper attacks on Fidel Castro in early April. Uh, and one of those attacks included Felix Rodriguez, who we feel is one of the people who was actually telling these war stories with Wheaton and Quintero. And the reason for that is Felix Rodriguez, along with Quintero, was the other guy that was doing logistics support for the Contras uh, in this Nicaragua project. So, again, some, we, we have learned, I will say something that's new, and, uh, is that we have learned that there were other um, rifle attacks, other teams sent into Cuba. Uh, on missions to apparently take out both Fidel and Shea, and all of those went bad. But uh, I just, for reference, uh, for years we've talked about the only effort to el eliminate Castro before the Bay of Pigs as being the Roselle poison pill plot, and we've learned in the last few years that that is just absolutely not true. There were much more serious military efforts that fail for a variety of reasons. Okay, Carl Jenkins. Let's go to the next slide. After the Bay of Pigs, he was reassigned to Vietnam, worked as a special warfare advisor for I Corps out of the name, and most importantly for us, in the summer of 1963, he was brought back to work on a new Cuba project. Um, with none other than Mr. Quintero. Uh, this project was called Amworld. And Henry Hecksher, who we won't go into great detail here, was the administrative head of Amworld, uh, one of several operations under Fitzgerald. Our 
Fortime was the political chief of AMWORL, Quintero was the military operations chief, and what is most important for our perspective is AMWORL was totally autonomous in terms of its own recruiting, its financial and military operations, its CIA staff was only involved in support, coordination, logistics, some efforts at operational security. We've learned a lot more about that in the last <coughs> year. But one of the things that makes this AMWORL project most interesting is that it recruited a number of people during September and October of 1963 who were essentially recruited, put under Quintero, put under Jenkins, and stayed in the United States basically off the books. Uh, one of the things that's increasingly difficult is these people were living in Miami, they traveled domestically, they had money available to them that was unaccounted for between the CIA, it was used to purchase supplies, it was used to purchase weapons. We know some of them did go to Texas. Uh, it puts a very interesting group in play that was totally off the books. Uh, in January and February, they were black exfiltrated in Nicaragua, but what they were doing, what they might have been doing in Texas, gets to be very interesting. Okay, next slide. Okay. Let's go into Ms. Mr. Quintero a bit. Quinn Carroll was one of the early, very early trainees for guerrilla operations inside Cuba. He actually recruited and took the first set of trainees that were, were briefed and scanned and vetted and sent to Panama for training. He was inserted prior to the Cuban brigade landings and operated covertly on the island and did Felix Rodriguez. He also evaded capture on the island even after the disaster at the Bay of Pigs, managed to get back to the U.S., developed plans for a new military initiative against Castro that were actually submitted to RFK, reviewed by Maxwell Taylor, and then submitted to the CIA resulting in the fact that Quintero was selected to be one of the two Cuban leaders in this new AMWOR project. And one of his proposals was for a new assassination effort against Castro and other senior Cuban leaders. Now, one of the reasons why this becomes important in this context is that what we will find is Mr. Quintero seems to been acknowledged by the people he associated with have, have, as a proponent of and having been associated with assassinations. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Amor was closed down in 1965. Quintero was retained as a contract employee working with a variety of companies for the CIA, CA fronts in Mexico and Central America, officially separated in 71. In 76, he was approached by Ed Wilson of uh, Libya fame, among other things, to take part in an assassination. A again, it's kind of interesting. It's like when, it, when Ed Wilson just goes, oh, you know, Gaddafi wants us to assassinate people. Who in the world would I go to do? Oh, oh, I remember Mr. Quintero. He's good at this sort of stuff. Uh, Quintero went back to Carl Jenkins, who advised him to avoid Wilson, definitely good <laughs> advice. Um, in 85, he moved on to become a field supply and support coordinator for legal activities in the Nicaragua program. Worked under Seacord and North. The interesting thing is that he was joined by none other than his longtime fellow anti-Castro activist and, and mission person from the, from the Bay of Pigs era, and Felix Rodriguez and Mr. Quintero were the guys that you needed to sell if you wanted to do transport to the Contras. So it's pretty obvious that they would have been chief contacts for Wheaton and Jenkins to try to sell to. Let's go on to the next page. Yep. Talk briefly about Felix Rodriguez. 
He too had been an early CIA volunteer and trainee for the guerrilla <laughs> operations inside Cuba. Had participated in the pre-invasion maritime missions, just as Quintero had, and a number of other interesting people had. Uh, he joined Amaral in the fall of '63, personally recruited by our team A. Black infiltrated out of the U.S. at the very end of '63. Um, following Amworld, he was one of the few people ever retained by the CIA as a totally deniable field agent. Very special. You know, these people that we're talking about here are special. They're just not your run-of-the-mill agents or operatives. Uh, he actually was involved in capturing Che Guevara. Uh, he went on to be involved with activities across Latin America. And let's go on. By 72, he was back in Latin America, in Argentina, working off the books, and at that point in time, he joined Ed Wilson. So again, Ed Wilson, like, okay, two names pop up when Ed Wilson is recruiting Cuban exiles as being the guys that you need to go to, and one of them is Quintero, and the other is Rodriguez. And Rodriguez actually did some work for, for uh, Wilson, and interestingly enough in his book, uh, he brags about the fact that he was sophisticated enough to work for Wilson while he was working for the CIA and totally fooled his case officer about what he was doing, including traveling overseas to work. Which is an interesting thing when you think about what I said earlier. Oh, we have a group of the most skilled and most aggressive Cuban exiles that are recruited in the AM world. They're inside the United States. They're officially on a new CIA project, but nobody knows what they're doing in the fall of 1963. And as Mr. Rodriguez said in his book, they were also good enough to fool with CIA case officers just about any time they wanted to as to what they were really doing. Um, okay. This is another good time for me to pause. What we've done is we've read in another name to the Wheaton names, and it's it's almost impossible to think that Wheaton would not have Wheaton and Jenkins would not have been meeting with both Rodriguez and Quintero. So whatever war stories they heard, whatever names they heard, would have been people that were common to Jenkins, Quintero, Rodriguez. Not only common, but common from anti-Castro missions uh, over years, and certainly quite trusted among all of them. Any questions at this point? Uh, I've got one, uh, actually. Who, who, I, I should know this, but who was Ed Wilson? Oh, Ed Wilson was a former CIA employee who essentially went, who went rogue. He... Um, he set up his own intelligence, private intelligence operation, sold, act, sold it to the Navy to do tracking of maritime assets. Um, did that for a couple of years, then kind of busted in doing that because it's like somebody took, took exception to the Navy buying this kind of intelligence from a private agent. And then, more importantly, he, he was a consultant to all, all sorts of people, basically deal-maker, supply uh, explosives, supply weapons, uh, but supply training. And he did a deal with Gaddafi to supply training and explosives, and it actually did a deal to supply assassins to Gaddafi to use against a variety of targets, including U.S. targets. Um, Wilson. Now, long, long story short is, later Wilson made an argument that while he was doing this, he was also reporting back to the CIA, and as it turns out, he was. Uh, but, you know, that's one of those things, I don't think anybody feels that he wasn't there to make money, he was just covering his tracks by reporting back as to what Gaddafi was doing as well, uh, which is pretty common among these folks. Does that, that's a brief explanation. That's right. Any other questions? 
Right, right. I'm, I might be confusing it with somebody else, but are any of these people linked to the Watergate burglars? Um, none of these people are directly linked to the Watergate burglars. Um, no, these, in all honesty, I guess the way I would put it is these guys are all much more serious than the Watergate burglars. Not to imply, I mean, uh, a couple of the human that were recruited for Watergate, you know, one, one of them in particular was a very experienced CI boat guy, but those were people that Howard Hunt had known, and you've got to remember that Howard Hunt was a political officer. He wasn't an operational officer, and I think one of the things that confuses us sometimes is the real difference between those people. Uh, Jenkins was in the paramilitary. Uh, this was, you know, the paramilitary side, the field operations, the actual combat operations, Hunt never got close to any of that sort of thing. So Hunt knew an entirely different set of people. Okay, thank you. Okay. Oh, sure. And this, I realize this does get us deeply into names. I mean, this is a deep dive into names, and it's going to get a little deeper. And, and because you asked this, that although <coughs> one of the Watergate names is going to come up in the next slide, peripherally, uh, so that was a good segue to that. But let's go to the Amoral team. Hello, Larry. The Am the Admiral team, uh, and these are just some names to, to remember that, that emerge out of all this, that become very interesting as possibilities of the names that were actually dropped during the war stories that Wheaton overheard. Um, the Admiral team, again, as I mentioned before, was designed to be autonomous. Uh, one of our teammates, longtime financial accountants and friends, was doing all the financial work for them. Most importantly, his name was Sexo Mesa. Um, he had a domestic operations account established at the First National Bank in Miami. And those were funded with $26,000 each. And that was available to anybody in Amworld for travel and domestic purchases. So one of the things that we've often pondered about is there if a, a group was to be funded to do the attack in Dallas, where might the money come from? Not a lot of money, because you're talking about volunteers, but for travel and for weapons, whatever. Well, this the Wheaton name story does take us into a group of people that did have money available to them that was CIA money and was totally off the books, and the CIA was not monitoring it and never did attempt to monitor it. I wish they did, or had, because then we could follow it, but they didn't. Felix Rodriguez, a key member of the Emerald team, ostensibly doing communications for the whole team and its, its operations in the Caribbean. Uh, air operations, well, some interesting names. Frank Sturgis turns up early on. Now, Sturgis goes away and does not really come up in the whole thing in the last half of 1963. But interestingly enough, he was a close friend of Artemi, and right out of the gate in the April-May time frame, when Artemi realized that he was going to need aircraft for this new operation, who did he send but Frank Sturgis, and where did he send them but to Dallas to attempt to procure a C-47 transport aircraft? Fascinating. We don't... That is documented in CI documents. We don't... We don't know what really happened about that, but that leads us into the point where we have been able to identify several pilots for Amworld, and a couple of those pilots become very interesting. One of them was Antonio Soto, who was a B-26 pilot at the Bay of Pigs and became an Amworld transport pilot. Another had actually done maritime infiltration with Rip Robertson, and both Soto and Navarro went on to the Congo with Rip Robertson in a very special team that Robertson put together to operate in the Congo. Uh, uh, Soto did 
and more than that, they actually actually became involved in the uh, McCarthy Project, which was essentially a deniable Cuban exile air force that the U.S. ran uh, in the Congo. The reason this comes up is very interesting, and I, again, not the sort of thing that I had time to go into here, but we have been led to the point that Soto may indeed, how many of you have heard of the Ray January incident at Red Bird Airport? Yeah. 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 Mark Smith's book. Three. The Cuban pilot that Ray January may very probably have been talking to was Antonio Soto, which would represent a tremendous break in this case because it, if it was indeed Soto, we know exactly who Soto's friends were in the fall of 1963. And when Soto, if it was Soto, told January that his friends we're going to kill JFK, and it would happen soon. And afterwards, told January that it happened just as he told them before the plane flew out of Dallas the afternoon of November 22nd. Um, you can understand how big a break that may be. Uh, Antonio Soto has emerged as one of the key names in this research uh, that we've developed over the, the past year. There are a couple of more pilots that are in contention but there are a lot of reasons to think that it would be Soto. Actually, beyond that, we have even gone so far as coming up with a very likely possibility for the CIA officer who was with Soto in Dallas, uh, and why he was there and what he was doing, that he had nothing to do with anything other than he was one of the very first CIA support officers assigned to the Amoral Project. And we have now learned about three or four of those guys that we did not even know existed a year ago. Um, other people that are very important and whose names turn up in all of this in these early Amoral <coughs> volunteers are Tony Esquerdo, Carlos Hernandez, and John Cochise. There's no way on earth I have the ability to talk about why they're important <laughs> at any great length, but I will tell everyone that we have, I have been blogging on these names on my blog, Larry Hancock on WordPress, and if you do a week name search on that blog, you will find me going into the background of why these names are important, uh, and why these names could very well have been the names that we can hurt, uh, in particular is where though. Okay, let's go to the next. Okay, so let's make some assumptions here. With this, with this as background, um, what assumptions can we make about what Wheaton might have heard? Well, it seems logical to assume that these guys are talking, they're getting together and they're talking in the middle of the 80s. What do they have in common? What do Jenkins and Quintero and... Rodriguez have in common that they could be talking about. Well, since they're all talking about Nicaragua, and that's where everything's happening, and that's where Wheaton's trying to sell, you know, transport in regard to the Nicaraguan project, you could probably assume they spent talking some time about Nicaragua, people they had known in Nicaragua, who had been in Nicaragua, and, and by the way, I should mention that the other name I had brought up before that might very well have been part of these conversations was Luis Posada, who was working for Rodriguez at the time uh, in Contra Supply. So one could assume that the war stories would involve Cubans and Nicaragua, who had some association with Jenkins and Quintero in Nicaragua. One of the first names that pops out of the bat for that would be Nestor Esquerdo, who had been one of the very first Cuban exiles to go to Nicaragua in support of the Contra military efforts. He's a long time associate of Ar Artemi and Quintero. He was one of Jenkins' very first trainees in Panama. We have document after document about Esquerdo. Um, if you were to pick probably the most respected, fervent, anti-Castro, 
Cuban exile who dedicated himself to the whole cause militarily and operationally, it would be hard not to come up with people like Rodriguez and Esquerdo. Does anybody know anything especially interesting about Esquerdo in Miami? Yeah, there's a statue to him. There's a statue to him. Uh, so he is, he, he does really stand out. Uh, he had been a resistance fighter inside Cuba with Artemi and Quintero, pre-landing missions into Cuba, post Bay of Pigs missions into Cuba under none other than Rick Robertson, an early volunteer for Amworld, along with Felix Rodriguez and Carlos Hernandez. And Rick Robertson had taken him from that project to a highly secret CIA mission in the Congo in early 1964. So Esquerdo really stands out for the names that he's associated with. Um, so again, we're now in, in an area of speculation, uh, but it certainly makes sense that if they're talking about someone who's trusted, who's mission connected to all of them, and who would come up in conversation with talking about in Nicaragua and go, oh, we remember what else Nestor did, uh, he would be one of, a name that could very likely come up. Another name that very, it's almost impossible, didn't come up, let's go to Nicaragua Connections, the next yeah. slide, is Rip Robertson himself. Um, again, we often, I, well, I've done this myself for years, um, we underestimate Rip Robertson because everybody knows Rip is kind of the CIA cowboy. Okay, he's a frogman at the Bay of Pigs. He was in the Guatemala Project and he bombed a boat when he wasn't supposed to. Okay, everybody knows that about Rip Robertson. But what we fail to remember about Rip Robertson is that he had had some actually rather major roles in these things. For example, he had worked directly with the president of Nicaragua during the PBS, PB Success Project, the, the Guatemala thing. And he, in 1960-61, he ran, organized, negotiated with, and ran the CIA Cuba strike base at Puerto, Puerto Cabezas. Probably didn't pronounce that wrong, but um, he was... And it's amazing to read the report on the uh, Bay of Pigs operation. He was like the United States representative to the president of Nicaragua, and for a year he was the guy conducting foreign relations with Nicaragua, getting Nicaragua to support the Bay of Pigs project, or, well, the Cuba project. Um, the guys that Jenkins had trained in Panama, went on to serve under Robertson following the Bay of Pigs, and a number of them went into Amworld and were in Nicaragua for early 1964, and, and Robertson recruited some of them. A number of those same individuals, Quintero, Rodriguez, Esquerdo, uh, joined the contra-military efforts against the Sandinista government in Nicaragua. And so as you go down the page, these names begin to come together. Um, if, if you want to find people who are operationally related that perhaps we've even talked about in the past as being involved in the JFK assassination, Robertson certainly does come up there. Um, I mean, we've had lots of rumors and gossip about Robertson being involved in that. Um, but here's where we find the names crossing with each other. And it makes sense. It doesn't prove anything. But we're definitely starting with Gene Wheaton, who we knew nothing about. Suddenly, we're now talking about Rip Robertson and Felix Rodriguez, who we've known about for a long time. Um, let's go down another slide. Okay. Now, if we want to connect names, so where does this leave us? And I'd like to say, oh, okay, the next thing I'm going to tell you is Okay, here are the names of the guys who went out, but I can't do that. Um, just doesn't work that way. But when we're looking at this from a bigger picture, we have other people who have told us about Dallas. And one of the fascinating things is 
at this point in time, they all fit with what we get out of Wheaton's story. Um, John Martino, all, all, all of these people were pre-assassination sources on a threat to JFK and said that the motive for the attack was that JFK was killed by Cubans for being a traitor. John Martino, even before the assassination, wrote about JFK being in secret talks with Castro and told his family JFK would be killed in Texas. Philippe Vidal, who was a very close friend of Martino, uh, spoke openly and admittedly about JFK threatening the Cuban exiles by doing a deal with Castro in the fall of 1963. Roy Hargraves, another friend of Martino, was actually reported to the FBI on suspicion of having been involved in Dallas, and they investigated him and famously cleared him in, in a totally bogus inquiry, which we deconstructed. And later, of course, Martin, or Hargraves himself did admit in person to having been in Dallas as part of the conspiracy. Rolando Otero, who was a personal friend of Squerdo, told Gaten Fonsi that JFK was killed because the exiles knew of the secret deal that JFK was beginning to work with on, with Castro on. And finally, we have the remarks from J Ray January, who was told by a Cuban exile pilot that JFK would be killed before the assassination. So again, this isn't cooperation in a legal sense, it's purely circumstantial, but again, starting with Gene Wheaton, who never heard about before, and following names, you end up with some names and sources which are very consistent. Um, and, one more slide. Yep. We also have verification of what Martino and Otero and, and what we just heard. We have verification that there were existing threats against JFK in the fall. Uh, we know now know in detail that the JFK Castro outreach was compromised, and we even know that J.M. Wade suddenly, out of nowhere, after totally ignoring this guy for years, was just very hot on the trail of the individual who was Castro's con back channel contact with Kennedy. So not only was the JFK Castro back channel negotiation known, it was known down as far as JM Way and even in Mexico City because the CIA was trying to locate AMOT contacts, uh, the Cuban Intelligence Service, that they could turn on Bahio and figure out what he was doing. Uh, we know that the Secret Service engaged both the CIA and the FBI to counter a potential Cuban attack on JFK during his Miami visit and his Florida trip. We also know that the Secret Service record Secret Service destroy records that we would very much like to see about JFK's travel that fall. That fall. Well, we know that um, on November 22nd, RFK approached a leading Cuban exile leader, and this was one of the, the two first calls that RFK made about the fact that his people had killed his brother. So what we know is that as far as RFK was concerned, the very first suspects that came to mind that afternoon were people associated with the CIA and people associated with Cuban exiles. <clears throat> and we also know that the J.M. Wave conducted a secret investigation of Cuban exile environment after the assassination, lied about it, and then apparently either buried or destroyed the information they collected. So this certainly, again, would tend to verify the motive, the threat, the source that the Wheaton names connect to. Huh. Okay, last slide. I'm getting close to being done. Okay, yeah. So who knew? Can we connect the names? And I just present you, this is a thought exercise. Um, 
So what you set down is you do a matrix. John Martino apparently knew in advance. Who did he know? Otero knew in advance. Who did he know? January. Seforza, who was the AMOC chief at JM Way, who did he know? Wheaton, and if you notice, if you put this in a matrix, son of a gun, those names just keep coming up over and over again. So in conclusion, all I can suggest to you is what we take from the Wheaton investigation is yet another track into the conspiracy who brings us back to a similar set of names and that these names probably are truly indeed involved with the Dallas attack. And we'll take some more questions. Oh, and by the way, I should say, I just, um, just blog an update on our weak name research on my blog if you want to check that out as to as to where we are now and we do have a, a uh, my blogs contain a link to our weak names research paper which just has a ton david boyle and i are doing this uh, he's doing most of the work i'm just writing it up um contain a ton more detail on these various names and associations Thank you very much, Larry. Thank you. We've got some questions. We've got Bart here. Hi, Larry. Certainly. Bart, Bart Kemp here. Um, I've got a quick question. The movie that is on YouTube uh, on the Wheaton film was shot by Mark Sobel in connection with William Matson Law. Um, the actual movie, uh, which which is very good. I find it one of the most uh, intriguing uh, videos I've seen in the last few years. Um, the movie was shown on the at the Lancer conference uh, probably about almost a decade ago. And the question is here, is this actually... It was shown, uh, it was actually Wheaton's wish that it wasn't going to be shown. So my question is actually, why was it shown at the Lancer conference? Because eventually the movie torpedoed any further collaboration with Wheaton as such. Like well, actually, we actually we had contacted Gene. He, he had never really said he didn't want to show. Right. Uh, I had Mark. Basically, what happened was that Mark and William were in California doing a series of interviews <clears throat> related to RFK. Yes. So I managed to get them to take some time out and go film that. Well, the practical matter of what happened is Mark did the footage. William did the interview. Mark owned the third footage commercially. And Mark, for some time, considered um, doing something commercial with it. Uh, he went back to Gene, and I, I don't even know that he went back to Gene. I, I think he considered that, considered that obviously if he did something commercial with it, he would have to get a release. We did manage to track Gene. Gene moved not long after the interview. Uh, it took us a couple of years to find him again. William did find him again. He talked to him again via telephone. Wheaton was not really angry about anything. He just, he basically was just saying, look, I said, you, you've already got what I, what I said. I stand behind that, you know, and basically they left it at that. Right. And I, I asked Mark, before we showed it at the conference, I said, well, Mark, you know, are you going to do anything with it? Mark said, I still don't know if I'm going to do anything with it, uh, but it's okay for you to show it, but you can't distribute it, okay? You can't put it on the internet. You can't do anything like that. And it was about another, oh, goodness, about until after Wheaton had passed away that Mark felt comfortable with giving the authority to actually distribute it. Yeah not commercially, but just to make it available to Lancer to put on the internet. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Thanks for clarifying. But, uh, just I, just <laughs> to uh, let me give you a little anecdotal story. Um, at one point in time, I never personally talked to Gene Wheaton because later on he moved in with his daughter and his grandkids, and, and that made him a little bit more sensitive, I think. But in one of the chain exchanges, we called him. I wasn't on the phone. I, well, I was listening. Okay. But, uh, so it's kind of like, his daughter picks up the telephone. Yes, this is so-and-so. 
primary she Wheaton. Well, uh, and so she just, she's a very efficient gatekeeper. We found that daughters are very good gatekeepers for these folks. And, but at, at a little bit into the conversation, it was clear that Jean was in the background because the next question she asked of my friend was, do you know Larry Hancock? And I'm going, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is Gene Wheaton's house. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for uh, uh, clarifying that issue. Cheers. Oh, you bet. All right. Any other questions, folks? David. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Malcolm. Malcolm. What date do you have, Larry, for uh, Sturgis going for the C-47 in Dallas? Yeah, that fascinates me because there's no more about it. I mean, it just literally shows up in one of the very first, before AMWorld has been really structured and put together under Heckscher, it's like RFK and our team have agreed that they're going to do something, okay? And it, it, there's just a note that says Sturgis has been sent to Dallas to look into getting an aircraft. Now, what we have learned later, and, and you know, why would, why, what's unique about Dallas and an aircraft for AMWorld? What we learned later was when we began to, to investigate this was that Jan, Ray January for almost all of 1963, had been selling a series of transport brokering, I should say, a series of transport aircraft that were going to the CIA through the Houston Air Center. And the majority of those aircraft, it looks like, ended up in this Makasi uh, Congo operation that the CIA was doing with Cuban exile pilots. And so I think the reason that this all ended up was because the CIA already had this sourcing deal through January's companies at Redbird Airport. Now, how Sturgis would have even known of that, I have no idea. I mean, it makes perfect sense that Soto would have gone there to accept an aircraft because he was actually flying already in the Congo and had been flying in the Congo early in 1963 and had come back on leave and would go back to the Congo in 1964. So it makes sense to see Soto there. And now that we know about those aircraft and the Houston Air Center and 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 it all comes together, except I, I have no idea why Sturgis, well, I wish I could explain that, Malcolm, no clue. David. Uh, hi, oh, sorry. Hi, Larry. Um, very briefly, uh, is there anything in the work you've been doing on uh, Wheaton's names that tells us any more about Esquerdo and whether or not there is any credibility to Fetzer's claims that Esquerdo was actually one of the shooters uh, from the Daltex building? I think I think what lends some more credibility to it is that we've been able to determine that Rodriguez, Esquerdo, a fellow codenamed Secundo, which we give the true name in the, the, what we published, that three or four of these guys were trained marksmen and they were sent into Cuba on these as part of these missions to kill Castro. So that, that doesn't, I, don't, I can't do anything to put him in the building. I can set up a class of trained marksmen that were used on Castro assassination projects that have the right skill set, and it's where it fits that. You know, I, one of the things I think that's, that's troubled me for a long time is we tend to come up and pick people to be shooters in Dallas who don't really have the credentials to be shooters in Dallas. You, if this is a, a paramilitary assault, you've got to have people and have the operational experience to do that sort of thing. And we do know that in the fall of 1963, Quintero was putting together assassination teams to kill Castro. Uh, uh, I know this is a long-winded answer, but 
Another thing that is corroborative about this is if you remember John Roselli, when he came forward at the beginning of the Garrison investigation, offered uh, everybody in D.C. the concept that a, an assassination team to kill Castro, Cuban assassination team to kill Castro, had been turned on JFK. His story was just that, J, uh, that Castro had done that. Uh, that never made any sense. But certainly the picture of a series of shooters who were operationally trained to infiltrate, exfiltrate, work as a team, do these kind of sniper attacks. Uh, the attacks that they were trained for, for Veradero Beach uh, to assault the Castro, uh, not motorcade, but uh, travel to the to the resort, very similar to Dallas. So, now, my real problem in answering your question is because these guys, this Cuerdo and this particular set of, like Carlos Hernandez, this particular set of early immoral volunteers go dark, we were totally unable to trace them. The CIA just took them off the books. They're autonomous. They're being supported by the CIA but we have nothing that gives us their travel. We, we do have some suspicions that a couple of them who were DRE members also traveled to Dallas under DRE cover, uh, probably ended up in the house in Harlandale. Um, but all of that speculation, they're just no <coughs> records. Um, the, only, the only shot we appear to have is determining whether or not Soto was really the guy at Redbird. If we could contact the CI officer, we think was with him. But we, we just don't know. We kind of hit a stone wall, honestly. Okay, thank you. Oh, is there one more question? Two more questions. Two more. Malcolm? Okay. All right, okay, Peter. Just proving that we're awake here at uh, Canterbury still. Um, your guy at uh, Redbird, that was Wayne. January, not Ray. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's all right, don't do it again. <laughs> <coughs> not sure where I got Ray. Uh, Ray. I, and I should also note that all of the January material was originally developed by a British researcher. Uh, and he sourced that, and I worked with him for four years. Uh, the, the January thing really evolved over years and years because we didn't even have the detail number of the aircraft that we could really identify and track until after Mr. January passed his way and his wife decided to share that. And uh, anyway, that was a long story in and of itself. But yeah, sorry, definitely Wayne January, my mistake. Uh, Larry. Um do you remember if Wayne Jerry generally had his own uh, aircraft company at Redford, supplying aircraft? Is that correct? Yes, he actually had more than one one aircraft. He actually was a partner in, and I, I guess you would say, but a, a partner in, as I recall, like three different companies. One actually owned and flew aircraft. Another was clearly a, uh, what would you call it, a, a brokerage firm uh, where it simply bought aircraft, reconditioned them, and transferred them on to a third party. Uh, an interesting thing about that, and which also suggests that it was CIA, was it was standard practice that when they were transferred to that third party, the paperwork was just held and the, hell, the aircraft was never legally sold for one to two years later, clearly when it had finished its use, and it was sanitized again and sold to a commercial aircraft. So that the actual use for like two or three years was never recorded, and then suddenly you see the aircraft like going somewhere sold. Uh, but I, so answer is yes, he was involved with more than one one company. Did you know the, 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 there was a company logo? <coughs> oh goodness, I, I I have to admit I do not. 
Maybe if I, I, if I do it, it's kind of like that Ray January, Wayne January thing. Maybe I don't I remember it. Maybe something to you that might help. Yeah, I would love to see that. No, I, I don't remember ever seeing an actual logo. I've seen some business papers, but nothing, you know. Okay. Again, I should say, just to give credit there, uh, only after we got the tail number did my friend Alan Kent, we managed it. Well, the real break was Alan helped me with it, and then we actually, interestingly enough, got an ex-FAA employee who got permission from his boss to tell us what, to get the net paperwork on the aircraft. It, it's kind of amazing how long, you know, something that I gloss over and describe in, you know, 30 seconds on one of the slides I just showed you, took us 10 or 12 years to learn. Yeah. Larry, thank you very much indeed, once again, for your input. It's uh, always very much appreciated. Very clear, concise and informative. Thanks very much. Thanks very much.